Hello everyone and welcome back to Prestige Reef. Today we're going to cover the topic how to aquascape a saltwater aquarium, as well as how important aquascaping actually is. This has been a tricky video to create because it's very subjective and because it can be both important and irrelevant depending on which way you look at it. Here's why. If you think about it, there are literally thousands of successful reef tanks out there with all different types of aquascapes, ranging from minimalistic to full rock walls. Therefore it's difficult to pinpoint exactly what scape is best, and that's because it's all a matter of opinion. It's kind of like art, different people appreciate different things. Secondly, after it's covered in coral, you won't even see the majority of the aquascape anymore anyway, so does it really matter what it looks like underneath? as long as you personally are happy with it. So rather than try to tell you what the perfect scape is, I'll explain how and why I've done mine, along with some tips which you certainly should do. Creating an aquascape isn't that different from creating a sculpture. The first thing you need to do is decide what materials you want to use. There are lots of different types of rock to choose from, but they can be essentially divided into three categories, dry, live, and man-made. I've used all three in the past, and I can say with 100% certainty, from the perspective of how easy building the aquascape was, man-made was my favourite. I find it generally fits together more seamlessly, without having to alter it, where it's hard to see where the different pieces connect, making your scape look more natural. For this build, I'm using Carib Sea's Life Rock, Niles' Reef Cement, Ecotex Coral Glue, and Red Sea Reef Base. I'll be honest with you, when I first saw this rock, it was on a table drier into Zoo 2018, and I was reasonably unimpressed by it. It wasn't until I spoke to the Carib Sea rep and he showed me it wet in a tank that I was sold. It looked completely different, which is a shame because most people don't get a chance to see it wet before they buy it. I knew from then on, the next tank that I was setting up would be using it. It's made from real aragonite base rock mined in Florida from an area which thousands of years ago was underwater and part of the ocean. The reason this rock is ideal is because it's very porous, which creates an ideal home for bacteria to thrive. It's then coloured to make it look more similar to live rock, and then coated in a bacteria which becomes active once it comes in contact with water, essentially giving you the benefits of live rock, without having any of the negatives of harming the environment or introducing an unwanted pest or algae. You know exactly what's in your tank from day one, which is a luxury you just don't have with live rock. There are multiple different shapes and sizes, and although it does appear that some of them have similarities between them, each piece is unique, and they can be broken up to create even more unique pieces. The first thing I always suggest people do before they even think about touching the rock is decide what type of tank they want. For example, will it be a fish only, mixed reef, SPS dominant, or something else? It's best to create a list of fish and coral which you can't live without, and then start planning from there. Knowing what you're trying to create from the beginning can help with so many different aspects of the hobby, including the aquascape, as it will allow you to create the optimum environment if you know your coral placement in advance. For example, some corals prefer shady areas and will need additional shelter from being blasted by powerheads, while others will need to be high up in indirect flow. It's not just corals either. Fish have very different requirements with regards to rock work and sand depth, and getting these right now can significantly reduce the amount of stress they experience. Almost all the fish we keep are prey to something bigger than they are, and naturally this can make them pretty nervous. They are constantly aware of their surroundings and where the nearest safe place is. Therefore ensuring your fish have multiple caves and overhangs to dart into can create a much calmer tank, where they'll be out more often. This will also help when it comes to mixing aggressive fish. When aquascaping, I like to lay out all the rocks so I can get a feel for exactly what I'm working with, and then, outside the tank, start playing around with different ideas. It's best if you measure out a piece of cardboard the same size as the base of the tank, so you don't start building something too big or too small. If you're struggling for ideas of what to do, then a quick Google search is a great place to start getting ideas which you can then replicate. As this is a branded tank, it's even easier for me, as I can see exactly what people have done with the same system. Once you're confident you have a rough idea, it's time to start building it in the tank. The number one rule here is to place the rock in first, directly on the glass. This is extremely important and don't let anyone tell you anything different. Certain fish love to burrow in the sand, and if you place the rock on sand, rather than on the glass, it won't be long before the fish moves the sand and creates a rock slide, potentially killing the fish and cracking the glass. Having said that, 
Placing it directly on the glass only applies to the base. I like to keep the rock a couple of inches off the side panels, as these will eventually get covered in algae, and if you're like me and want them all to be algae free, then you need to leave enough room to get an algae scraper down the back. Although I'm not going to tell you exactly how to scape your tank, as it comes down to personal taste, there is a rule which is used in photography, which can help make your scape more interesting. It's called the rule of thirds, where the picture is divided into nine even sections, and the focal points aren't in the middle. This forces the viewer to look around, taking their attention away from the center. Perception of depth is also important, as it's far more interesting viewing an object which is more three-dimensional. Therefore, placing some rocks closer and others further away from the glass is important. If you're having multiple rock structures, having them at different heights can also make them more visually appealing. This was one of the most common things people pointed out to me when I posted my aquascape on Instagram. My structures are the same size. This is because I've already taken into account coral placement, and the structure on the left will gain additional height from various branching coral species. Once you're content with what you've created inside the tank, it's time to start making sure it's secure. You have two main choices. Either you can stack it in a way where it's wedged together and can't move. This is by far the most risky, but eventually, corals, sponges and algae will over time secure everything in place. Alternatively, you can go down the route and use a cement product to make sure 100% that they can't come apart. As I mentioned earlier, the products which I decided to go with for this are Niles' Reef Cement and Ecotex Coral Glue. They're easy to use and the cement comes in a powder form which you just add water to, and then can be used inside or outside the water. The same applies to Ecotex Coral Glue. I place them inside the rock where possible and in areas which can't be seen so it doesn't take away from the natural look of the scape. It's important that it doesn't just look good from the front, but every single angle which is viewable, so if your aquascape looks good from the front, but unsightly from the side panels due to how you've secured it, you won't have achieved your goal. Take your time. Nothing good in this hobby happens quickly, and this is essentially the foundation of everything which will go in. When you think you're happy, it's always best to leave it for a few days before you cement it. Every so often you'll walk past a tank and either smile at how happy you are with your creation, or be annoyed by something and want to change it. It also works the other way around, as at first there was a part of my skate which I didn't like, and now that the sand's in, I don't even notice it. This is the final thing I want to speak to you about, sand. Sand, or lack of it, is one of the more hotly debated topics in the hobby. Now don't get me wrong, I love a nice bare bottom as much as anyone, I just personally don't think they belong in a reef tank. There is something about sand which adds so much to the aesthetics, that in my opinion, having it far outweighs the positives of not having it therefore it's unlikely I'll ever run a tank without it. There are different types of aquarium sands, but you want to find one that's made of aragonite, as this will help stabilise the pH and alkalinity, while also containing essential elements. Grain size is also important, and I found that 0.5mm to 1.5mm to be my favourite, and is ideal for fish like sand sifting gobies. Large grains contract detritus and become a nutrient sink, while smaller grains are too easily blown around by your powerheads and can leave ball patches in the sand. For ease of maintenance and to create a natural looking reef, I like my sand bed to be under one inch. This is because it's deep enough for your aerobic bacteria to find a home and multiply, but not too deep to create a nutrient sink, an anaerobic environment, which can be problematic long term if they aren't maintained properly. The sand I'm using doesn't need to be washed, as it's live and contains beneficial bacteria. Dry sand, however, should be treated very differently, as this can be very dusty and may need multiple washes, but trust me, it'll be well worth it in the end. If you're planning to add sand to a tank, it's best to do it before you add water. However, if you don't have that option, a neat trick is to use a funnel and PVC pipe. Add sand to the funnel and then pour water in to push it out the other end slowly, without disturbing it too much. Remember though, if you're adding to an already established sand bed, be careful to do this very slowly, and a few millimetres at a time, so that you don't accidentally kill off the existing bacteria and microfauna in the existing sand. So in answer to the question, how important is aquascaping, there are certainly some benefits with scaping in a certain way, but at the end of the day, you're the one that has to live with it, so create something that makes you happy, as hopefully you'll be looking at it for the next 10 years. I hope you enjoy watching my video, please feel free to comment below if you have any questions, if you did enjoy it, why not click that like and subscribe button? 
Have a good week, and I'll see you next time. As always, I just want to say a massive thank you to all the people that support the channel on Patreon. Never underestimate the value of what you do with regards to keeping this channel going. You've all been brilliant. Thank you.